Really, chapter 11 in 1 Corinthians through the end, uh, if I was going to label it, would be uh, the order in the assembly or uh, getting things right in the assembly, if you will, uh, especially until chapter 15, 16. Now, 15 is about the resurrection. But very quickly, I want to just give you an overview of these last chapters, and then we're going to look at some things in it. Again, I hope you've read it maybe even one, once or twice by, by this time. And uh, certainly, if you have any questions, please let me go. No. Uh, chapter 11, we've pretty much covered that with the Lord's Supper and everything else. Uh, he's telling them how to act within the assembly, especially in relation to uh, the Lord's Supper in keeping of the ordinances. In chapter 12, uh, look down to verse 18 in chapter 12. Uh, he gives the metaphor of the church being a body and we being members. In verse 18, chapter 12, it says, But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. Well, I wish every church would read that, every pastor would read that every Sunday and realize this is not our church. This is God's church. And we need to get out of the way. There's a lot of churches that are getting in God's way. Uh, the overwhelming theme in these next few chapters to me is that uh, we don't get to do whatever we want to do when we're here. Uh, we don't belong to us anymore. We belong to God, and this is His church. And He will build it, He will grow it, and He will set us in order if we will let Him. Uh, just a question for you to ponder. Do you believe the majority of churches today are letting God do what he said there in verse 18. Do you believe they're letting God bring the members in the way God wants to bring members in? Do you believe that uh, they're allowing him to order uh, the service and the members the way God wants to? Or are they taking a lot upon themselves? And before you answer that, uh, in your own mind, here's the evidence. If they are doing things outside of God's word in order to get things accomplished, then they're not letting God do it. How many a preacher have I heard today, well, we've got to do these things to get people to respond. Folks, God's spirit and God's power is the same today as it was then. It's just as powerful today as it was then. If we will continue to obey God, he will continue to build his churches the way he wants to. But I'm afraid there's a lot of churches that are getting in God's way. So he's setting the order. And right here he gives us uh, this great metaphor. In chapter 13... Uh, he goes into speaking of the spiritual gifts and uh, understanding that this was one of the main uh, jobs that the church members had at that time was their spiritual gifts and how they used them. In the last part of chapter 13, we have the uh, prophecy of the gifts failing or the gifts ceasing with the completion of God's word. And we'll look at that. Uh, tonight in depth if y'all want to. Then in chapter 14, he continues talking about spiritual gifts and uh, the purpose of them, uh, how they should use them, and having an orderly church service. I, I think chapter 14 is all about having an orderly church service. And again, we'll look at some of these things in depth, but if you'll look down to verse 33, it says, For God is not the author of confusion, but as Peace, as in all the churches of the saints. And then go to verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. One of the things, as we know, the church of Corinth had many problems. One of the things they were doing, their church services were not orderly at all. Uh, there would be six, seven people jumping up and saying something at the same time. And uh, evidently there were uh, people that were using their gift of languages and speaking in languages that nobody else knew. Uh, and Paul tells them, quit that. If there's nobody there that can understand you, don't even say it. Uh, there's some modern churches today that need to read this chapter again and realize that uh, that does not make you spiritual at all, doing those kind of things. Uh, again, there's several verses that we could look at on that matter, uh, but it sets the order. It, it tells who can speak and who can't, and uh, all, all of that there in chapter 14. Then in chapter 15... Uh, that is the wonderful chapter about the resurrection. Uh, the, the most information, really, we have about not just Christ's resurrection, but resurrection uh, totally. He tells us about the rapture that's going to happen. Uh, 
go down to verse 51 and 52. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. He tells us the reason of the resurrection, that there has to be a resurrection, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, which is why we have to be born again. We have to be spiritually born, because it is a spiritual kingdom. And then finally, chapter 16 uh, the first 12 verses, he talks about the, the uh, basically churches helping churches again, about giving offerings to the churches that were in need, and then the concluding words in verses 13 through 24. Uh, so that's what we have remaining in these. And before I uh, start with anything, uh, I'm going to open the floor up for questions. Is there any questions at all on these chapters or anything in 1 Corinthians that you've seen so far? Any that you've just been uh, dying to ask since you've read these on your own? That, that one you mentioned a few minutes ago, I know I've heard so many different people talk about that one. You get different translations, like in verse 51, 52, or 15. Mm hmm. The last trump, I have heard so many, just, just so many different interpretations. Talk about which one is. Somewhat close to the right one. All right, go down to verse 52. He's talking about, uh, you may see my, myself and my father getting a fist fight over this one. Uh, it says, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Uh, what is the last trump? Some believe that this is referencing the seven trumpets in the book of Revelation. Uh, a trump was a... Uh, I'm trying to say, modern day, we'd probably say an alarm, okay? Uh, this was the way they announced things. And this is the very last trumpet for us. It is a trumpet call. Uh, what is that trump, by the way? Is it an actual trumpet? We know what the trumpet is. Come on, y'all. The, the voice of God. The voice of the archangel, amen. The voice of God is the trumpet call. It's not an actual trumpet, by the way. If you go over to... Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through 18 we see uh, with the voice as of a trumpet he calls out. Jesus said in chapter 5 of John that uh, uh, when I call those that are in the graves will hear my voice. Uh, so it is the very voice of God. So what is the last trump? I believe it has nothing to do with the seven last trumpets uh, because it doesn't line up with when the rapture is supposed to be in Revelation for one reason but uh, it is simply a uh, the last alarm or the last call for us to come up hither, if you will, and meet God. Uh, I will say this. There, there are only two places that I believe are viable in Scripture for the rapture to happen. And before I tell you my opinion, I, I will say this. Nobody... Nobody with certainty can stand up and say, I know exactly when the rapture is going to be. Exactly. But, and, well, yeah, absolutely. Jesus said no one knows the day or the hour. But even, even the roundabout time, because uh, if any preacher will admit this to you, if you really get them where they're talking honest, uh, the two places that I'm talking about, there is enough evidence in both that I believe God left it that way so that we wouldn't know the exact time. Uh, if he wanted us to know, he would have told us. Now, I do believe this. I do believe when it gets closer to the time and we start seeing some of the things, those people that are living in that present time uh, will have a better idea than we do of that exact time. Uh, I believe that the rapture happens right before the first trumpet or right at the first trumpet in the uh, end of chapter 6, start of chapter 7, book of Revelation. That's the one time. The second time is before the last trump, which is interesting, uh, and it's before the uh, the reaping of the earth and all that that happens in, in chapter 14. It's the start of, uh, what chapter is it, Deb? The second place. Where do you think? Well, it's supposed to be around chapter 13 and 14. Right? It's right before chapter, chapter 14, but uh, all of these happen within the trumpets, and that's the interesting thing. Uh, so is the, does the last trump have to be referring to the trumpet judgments? I don't think so at all, if that answers your question. Brother Scott, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, and if you covered this last 
I'll rebuke you and then go on. Yes. But it falls in chapter 11. Mm hmm. In fact, say, if you went over this last week, I can get with you one on one. Go, no. On Go ahead. But a couple things that has, I've always been asked is one, dealing with the women covered in the hair. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you talk about that last week? No. We, co we covered it in Sunday school, but no, I didn't. Oh, okay. So that verse, you know, chapter, what is it, like chapter 11 through, you know, up to, I think, through verses 11. Mm -hmm. what, what are they referring to that? Okay. And then, uh, Back over in in chapter fifteen, where it talks about you know God God's not confused or anything. Then he goes back in speaking of women again. But then right after that, he talks about if men are going to be ignorant, going to be ignorant. I, I, I like more clarification of what he's referring to in reference to that. Gotcha. Okay, in chapter eleven, let's start there in chapter eleven. Did you know it is scriptural for men to take their hats off when they come in the church building, or to take their hats off when they pray? You ever wondered why we do that? It's in the Bible. Uh, let me say this in setting this up. These, what we're talking about in chapter 11, are outward signs of an inward condition. And what I mean by that, why do we kneel in prayer? Does kneeling in prayer do anything? Well, if our heart's not right, it doesn't. I can pray just as good driving down the road as I can kneeling in prayer. But, it's like I told my class Sunday morning, uh, some of my... Uh, most earnest prayers have been when I was on my face. Because, as I said, that is an outward sign of what's on the inside. Okay? God gives right here to men and women an outward sign of what's on the inside. And by the way, this is, he says it specifically, it is for the honor of their head. In other words, we take off our hats when we pray, or off our hats when we come in the building, to honor our head, which is Christ. Uh, and it is a sign of respect, even in our community today. Uh, if if uh, when it comes time for the uh, invocation, uh, there's somebody standing there that don't take their hat off, it's an outward sign of what? I mean, it's just plain to see and easy. The second one goes to the ladies. It tells them for just the opposite, for their heads to be covered in prayer. Uh, the Jews had a prayer shawl that they would actually pull up over their head. Now, here in chapter 11, uh, it doesn't say, you, ladies, you have to wear a hat. It says your hair is your covering. Uh, that is an outward sign of them recognizing their head, which is the man. And that's exactly what it says here. So it's not only to show uh, respect to God, but it's also to show the outside world that we respect God enough to say, hey, we're going to follow what he tells us to do. So, just as men taking off their hat is a sign of respect to God, women praying, being covered, is a sign of respect to their husbands. So, so what does it mean, um, if I read this in verse 7, when it says, for, for, for it's talking about, it is shame for a woman to be shown or shaved. Does that mean it's a, it, if a woman shaves her head, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shame? Or, I'm not saying short hair, but like myself, I mean, I don't... Uh, yes, because, again, it's an outward sign of an inward condition. Is it a shame for a man to keep his hat on when he prays? Is it a shame for a man to keep his hat on when he comes in the church building? Why? Again, it, it's your heart that what really matters. These are all just outward signs, but it's, it's an outward sign of what's on the inside. It's an outward sign to show everybody, hey, we are obedient to God. Uh, the outward sign really is for your witness. Again, it, God knows your heart, okay, whether you got your hat on or not, right? Uh, I can tell you all this. I've prayed with my hat on before. Uh, I pray walking around sometimes, don't you all? I mean, you don't always just have to take your hat off and get down on the floor and pray. Uh, uh, there's many times I don't close my eyes when I pray because I've done it driving down the road. It would be very dangerous if you closed your eyes. But the example here that God gives is mainly for our witness and to show honor to our head. That's specifically what it says there in chapter 11. Uh, it's a, uh, it also says it's a shame if you go on down uh, verse 14. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? 
it uses that word shame several times. I'm trying to word this exactly correctly is why I'm hesitating. <clears throat> Look at verse 15 too. But if a woman have long hair, it is her glory to her, for her hair is given for her covering. Please go back to verse... Uh -huh. Verse 7. This is, this is what this shows, okay? <clears throat> uh, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much he is the image and the glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. Uh, in our society today, you look at what's going on, and I'm talking about even religiously, women want to be in the same role that men have. And they are pushing for that. They've been pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing for that. Uh, let me ask you this. Why for the longest time was it wrong for a woman to wear pants to church? What's, wrong, what's the difference in pants and a dress? It was. It was. But it was called men's apparel. Well, there's actually a scripture about yeah. that. I think one of the biggest things is that we, we don't need to dress or have a hairstyle or anything that makes us stand out that we are saying to society, look at me, I'm special. But I, I want you all to go all the way back and think about the very first sin. And I'm talking about Satan's sin. What did Satan do? Now, there's a lot of things we can say. Well, it was his pride. It was this. Satan did not want to fulfill the position that God put him in. If you want to boil it down, he rejected God's purpose for his life, and he wanted to do what he wanted to do. Whether we want to admit it or not, he has given men a purpose, and he has given women a purpose. When we push that aside, and, and it's not just women pushing theirs aside. There's men wanting to be women today and do those things uh, what are we doing we're pushing against God's very purpose these right here are outward signs to say we are submitting to God and doing it God's way the right here the woman being covered is if you go that verse 7 is a sign to show honor to her husband saying he is my leader and I acknowledge it and I acknowledge that because God has said so does that make sense I mean it's, it's really that simple it's an outward sign of an inward condition. And it's an outward sign to the world that, hey, we're different. For the day. Yeah, the question, you had mentioned that just uh, in passing about the prayer shop thing. Because mm -hmm. like, every time like, you see like, the Orthodox Jews and things, and they have that, that thing over their head now, is that off against the scripture or when they do that? Or, uh, You're talking about the men, the men yeah. themselves? That's when they're outside considered the prayer shop. It, yeah, that thing. Uh, does it go against this? Is it exactly the opposite of this in chapter 11? Yes. If that helps you. Because it seems like, because even Paul, it seems like he was wearing those things when he was doing that. I don't know, it just seems like saying one thing and doing something else. Do you remember in the book of Acts where Paul got in trouble for shaving his head? Mm -hmm. Does everybody remember that? Why did Paul get in trouble for shaving his head in the book of Acts? <clears throat> Because it was a Jewish tradition and custom and he caved into it is exactly what it was for. He went with tradition and said the scripture. But you know, preacher, one of the dangers of, of what we're talking about is if we're not careful, we get very believable. That's yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I take my hat off when I come in. You know, I please God. Mm -hmm. So right. just... <laughs> this is a little thing and I will say it's little. And we do have to be careful about not being legalistic. Uh, I asked a question and I do, didn't really answer it. Why, why did pants used to be wrong? Uh, somebody defined to me what ladies' apparel is and what men's apparel is. <laughs> Does the Bible define what ladies' apparel is and men's apparel? That's when we get very legalistic, yeah. when we start saying, you have to dress like this or you're wrong. See, then we become legalistic. This right here is for each individual. Y'all know how I'm always saying that the woman should submit, but she shouldn't be forced to submit? Okay, we shouldn't have church rules up there that says, 
uh, this is what you got to do in prayer, and this is what that's that's being legalistic, okay? But is this something that each of us as an individual can do to show the world, hey, we're different? Absolutely. A good example of what we're talking about becoming legalistic was the Puritans. Uh, they were very religious and, and godly people. But they got very legalistic when it came to dress. A woman couldn't show her ankles. Uh, she always had to have something on her head. Always. <clears throat> See, all of those are men, man-made rules. Right. All of those are man-made rules. Uh, but now, also be careful. Remember Jesus said it's a narrow road. You can go quickly too far this way, and you can go quickly too far this way. What's going on in churches now? It don't matter how you dress, just come on. Well, is that wrong as well? Sure. You look at God's Word, and it tells us how to, and one of the things is not to stand out. So when, when you talk about the outward sign, so I, I don't want to take this That is that is fine if you look here. In fact, because, what, because it says women mm -hmm. are to keep their head covered. A woman is to keep their hat on oh, when they pray. That's what I wanted to clarify. That was Absolutely. The question I had is to clarify that. Okay. Yeah, because the lady is supposed to be covered. Now, her hair acts like that when she don't have a hat, but I personally love hats. I wish they'd come back into style. I love ladies' hats, and I love men, the fedoras and all those. I wish that would come back into style. But that is the reason, if you think about what is culturally accepted or was for a while, the ladies would leave their hats on inside and the men would take theirs off. Where did that come from? Right here, chapter 11. I just wonder if anybody knows why all branches of the military, when they come into a building, they have to remove the hat. Right here. It's a sign of respect. And they, I mean, it comes from right here. Where it comes from. A soldier could be covered or wear a hat inside as if he's carrying the flag or if he's armed. Yeah. If, he's, if he's carrying a weapon or if he's carrying the American flag, he has to keep his hat on. Uh, Y'all go over to 14. Scott also had a question about 14. Didn't you ask about 14 being ignorant? No, 14, oh, verse 38. 14, yeah, right. Back in 14, where it talks about, uh, uh, talking about the women being silent mm -hmm. on here. And, and I, I think I understand what, what they're referring to. But then again, put it down where it talks about men being ignorant. Me ignorant. Yeah, go back to verse 37. I love how Paul ends this. Uh, it puts a nail in everybody's coffin. Chapter 14, verse 37. Uh we think we live in a very progressive society today. And, and certainly, and what I mean by progressive, not in a good way, okay? Uh, progressive meaning wanting to go outside of God's Word. Even in this day, there were people that wanted to do that. Uh, you look at the, the women preachers, there's two on TV that are very popular right now. Uh, and I'm going to get their names wrong. Joyce Myers. Joyce Myers. And the other one looks a lot like her. I get them confused. But anyway... Uh, is it wrong what they're doing? Absolutely. God gives reason after reason after reason for a woman not to assert authority, not to teach, and not to even speak within the assembly meeting. Right here, the whole chapter is about keeping order in the church. Everybody was jumping up and talking, okay? Uh, is it possible to have an orderly spiritual service if everybody's jumping up talking? Uh, I don't know if y'all have ever been to a charismatic service or not. Uh, but uh, it's an adventure, if you want to put it that way. Uh, look at verse 37. After he sets the order, and uh, specifically he goes down telling the ladies that... Uh, now understand that the ladies had spiritual gifts just like the men did. There were lady prophets. Uh, the Bible talks about prophetesses. So they had the gift of prophecy. They had the gift of knowledge. They had the gift of tongues that they were to use outside the assembly meeting. But here, to keep order within the assembly, he said only one or two speak uh, at a time, and then he tells the women to keep silent as well. But verse 37 says, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual. In other words, uh, if you think you have uh, a gift of God to know what's right and wrong, and by the way, you talk to people... Everybody thinks they know what's right and wrong. 
especially on certain subjects like this. Look what Paul says. Let him acknowledge that the things I write to you are the commands of the Lord. Now you've got to understand that before you go to the next verse and get the ignorant part, okay? Because that is specifically in line with it because the very next word is a but which joins them two sentences. Does everybody see that? But let any, notice the word man is in italicized, so it's person, female or male. But if any be ignorant, uh, that the idea in that word, and I can tell you all why in the Greek, but it means you're willingly ignorant. In other words, I don't want to know what God's commands is. I want to do what I want to do. Uh, by the way, I have to tell you all, uh, the first church I pastored, uh, somebody had asked a question about this, and I read the text. I read the text, and I had a lady jump up and start yelling at me. I, I hadn't started preaching yet, okay? But she was basically saying, I'm not going to do that. And I've been mean, I mean, just going crazy, okay? Uh, look what it says. If any person wants to remain ignorant of this, let him remain ignorant. In other words, Paul, Paul is pretty much being... He's shutting the door on anything. He said, you have to acknowledge that what I'm saying is God's will. If you're not going to do it, you're willingly ignorant. You just stay willingly ignorant then. Uh, there's a whole chapter in Proverbs about people that are willingly ignorant of God's word. Y'all know how I'm always telling you it's easy to see God's will. You know what God's will is. Many times we don't want to accept it because we don't like it. Uh, here's something, obviously, that today people don't like. Well, guess what? They didn't like it then. That's why he ends it this way. You have to acknowledge what I'm saying is a command of God. So if you want to be ignorant of that, just stay ignorant of it. But you don't, you don't, hear, you don't hear a lot of people, like even pastors, talk about that. No. It's a, I think it's because, it, it's because they don't want to offend someone. <laughs> they don't want to say, this, this is God's word. And, uh -huh. you, and then basically you could say that verse right there, word for word. One of the reasons is, now I'm going to give preachers a little credit. One of the reasons is, yes, they don't want to offend anybody. And this is, can be a very offensive passage. But number two, this is again a willing submittance. It's not, notice God didn't tell uh, uh, Timothy, you call them down and shut them up. Okay? It's not for anybody to shut anybody up over. It's a willing submittance thing. And if you go back to chapter 11, again... Guys, if we take our hats off and we can all recognize that that shows respect for God, ladies, if you do what God says, is that not also showing respect for God? If you fail to do what God says, what is it showing? It's just like keeping your hat on. It's no big deal. I mean, it may not be a big deal for us. We may not like it, but obviously it's a big deal because God put it in his scripture not once, not twice, but three times. It's in chapter 11, it's in chapter 14, it's also in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And by the way, this goes, it's not a cultural thing either, because it goes all the way back in chapter 2 of 1 Timothy, all the way back to Adam and Eve. Did you know part of the curse upon woman was to be submissive unto her husband and to take that role? That was part of the curse upon woman. And she wasn't going to like it. No, nope. that, that's right, she wasn't going to like it. Uh, and he even goes back before the curse. He says in chapter 2 that uh, woman was made for man, not vice versa. God made man first, and the woman was to be the completer of man, not vice versa. Uh, it, it's easy to look at this the wrong way and to get very prideful. Just remind yourself of Satan and what he did. And I'm going to say this again. I've tried to say this every time, but I mean it from the depths of my heart. I said it in Sunday school class. There is no greater position on earth inside the home and inside the church than a godly woman, mother, and or wife doing her job. Amen. Amen. That is what will make a home a home. That's what will make a church a church. Amen. You, want the, you want the home to break down? Well, again, preacher, the, as you pointed out, it's a narrow road. If you get too far off to the left or right, uh, you know, there's some men that... I about to say, have men abused this? Absolutely. Tell a woman she can't say anything. Anything, you know, shut up. That's yeah. not what the sign 
Was that all your questions, Brother Scott? Did that answer your question about the ignorant thing? Yes. Uh, normally we don't look at the Bible this way, but Paul is actually being kind of sarcastic there. I mean, he's, he's pretty much saying, you know, if you don't do it, you're just ignorant, so just stay that way if you want to be that way. I don't want to bog you down, but I've got a question about uh, chapter 14, verse 2. Okay. And this is in King James, but he says, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to man but to God, for no one understands him. Mm -hmm. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. I don't understand that. Okay, you've got to look at the whole context of this, and I'm glad you brought that up. There, there's a whole denomination of church that believes in an unknown tongue. And by the way, if you look there, unknown is in uh, italicized, if you got that in verse, verse 2. And remember, the word tongue means, just simply means language, okay? The gift of tongues was a gift that gave people the ability to speak in a language that was not theirs, that they had never studied. It would be like me being able to speak German, just all of a sudden, boom, and I could speak it. He is, speak, he is speaking directly. Now, this was what was going on in church. Okay, let me tell you what was going on in Corinth, and maybe this will uh, make sense. Uh, during the middle of the church service, obviously, men, women, and everybody were getting up and just saying whatever came to them. Those that had the gift of languages would get up and just start speaking in a different language. Right here, he says, uh, and again, you've got to look at the context, because look, at, uh, look down to verse 4. He that speaketh in, and again, unknown is in italicized, but that's the idea. If you're speaking in a language that nobody else understands, the only thing you're doing is edifying yourself. In other words, why would you get up and speak a language where nobody else understood it? You were showing off. Look what God has done for me. Uh, now, I try to give you all a little, little Greek and a little Hebrew at times. But if I just sit up here quoting Greek and Hebrew all the time, what good would it do you? The only reason I would do it to show out and say, who, hey, look what I know. Right here, he says, if you do this, it's only benefiting you. It's not benefiting the church. In verse 2, he says, the only one that can understand you is God. Well, why, why would a person need to, need to speak in a different language to speak to God? That, that's not what he was saying. What he was saying there, God's the only one that can hear you. And if you go on down, he says, so quit. Don't say it. If there's nobody, let me find it. Uh, go down to verse 9. So likewise, you expect ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken? For you shall speak into the air. In other words, again, there's nobody there that can understand you. You're just talking in the air. God's the only one that can understand you. Hold on. Uh... Verse 19, maybe? 13. Right. Uh, he, he, he goes on to say, if there's no one there to interpret, don't do it. Uh, look at verse 19. Yet in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding. Now, see, all of this is connected back to verse 2. You, you can't just pull out verse 2 without these. He says, I would rather speak five words that people could understand that by my voice I might teach others than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. So it all goes back. He, what he's saying, Brother Smith, is if you're getting up speaking in a language that nobody can understand, God's the only one that can understand you. What benefit are you doing anybody except for yourself? Look at verse 22 there too. He tells them that uh -huh. it's, you don't need to be speaking in Language in the church service because it, that is for reaching the lost. Yeah, verse 28, go to verse 28. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence. So if you want to tie that back to verse 2, you don't have to speak in a different language for God to understand you, okay? That's not what he's saying. He's saying God's the only one that can understand you because we're all English in here and you're speaking German. He said, if there's nobody that speaks German, don't, don't talk. You may have a wonderful gift of God, but it's not needed right now. Make sense? Could I get you to interpret prophesying? Prophesying, very good. Uh, go, please go back to that verse 1 in chapter 14. Follow after charity. Now what is charity? Love. love. That is that godly love, giving people what they do not deserve. 
Now remember, love is a spiritual gift that still remains, okay? Should we still be seeking after God's love? Absolutely. And desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. He shows us at this point, uh, if you go back to chapter 13, the greatest of all gifts was love. He's already said that in chapter 13. In fact, he said, if I can speak in tongues, if I can prophesy, if I can do all of this and I don't have love, I'm nothing. Okay? And right here he tells us, he's trying to say again, uh, and that's the whole point of chapter 14, prophecy is so much greater than the gift of languages. Go down to verse, it was the one about edifying, uh, verse 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he that prophesieth edifies the church. You know what we're doing right now? You know what I'm doing? I am using the gift of prophecy. No, please bear with me, okay? The gift of prophecy has ceased. The gift of prophecy ceased, according to chapter 13, when the perfect prophecy came. And that's what we have open. Many times we think of prophecy, we think of someone foretelling the future. That's not what prophecy is. Prophecy is explaining what God intends. If you don't mind, go they back. Didn't have, they didn't have the New Testament. Go back to chapter 13, Brother Smith, and I'm gonna, I, I hope this will fully explain it. Uh, there were two gifts, that, or three gifts, that were very similar. There was the gift of knowledge, the gift of prophecy, and the gift of wisdom. Okay, those three. Uh, and all of those were very, very closely related. Remember that the church of Corinth did not have the New Testament at all. All they had was the Old Testament scripture. Uh, in fact, uh, when Paul wrote this letter, uh, there would be uh, very few letters circling at this point in time. Uh, the book of James would have been circling. It was written in the 40s. Uh, this would be in the 60s when 1 Corinthians was written. Uh, a couple of the Gospels had been written. So uh, the churches might have a couple, three letters at the most. Okay. So how did they teach? How did the pastor teach? How did they teach their classes? Certainly they looked at Old Testament Scripture, but they had been given the gifts, which was pardon me, specifically given to the early churches to, uh, well, the Bible says to build them up for the edification of the church. What they did was exactly what we do, but they did it with a closed Bible. They had the ability to teach God's word without it written in front of them. That was the gift of prophecy. That was the gift of wisdom. That was the gift of knowledge. They had the ability to tell God's word or the New Testament without it written down. And right here in chapter 13, please go to verse 8 in chapter 13. Charity or love. He's trying to tell them that charity, uh, that love is the most important. Charity never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, there's that other gift, it shall vanish away. Now please look at verse 9. For we, and he's talking specifically to them at that point in time. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. In other words, when they came to a church service, did they have the whole New Testament in their mind? No. They would have a section like we do when we come here and look at three or four verses, whatever it may be. Okay? They had their knowledge and their prophecy in little parts. It was given to them in little parts when they needed it. But look what he says in the next verse. He says, we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect, which goes right back to the knowledge and prophecy, when the perfect knowledge and perfect prophecy is come, then that which is in part, the knowledge and prophecy in tongues, will be done away with. Uh, God's promise and what Paul is saying, when, the, when God's word is complete, when the perfect are complete, the word perfect means complete, when God's complete prophecy comes forward, these gifts will be done away with because there will be no need for them. So what we do in our services is exactly what he was trying to get this church to do in their services. Church service don't need to be people getting up speaking in foreign languages. Okay, That's exactly what he said in chapter 14. And churches are still doing it today. 
you don't need to do that. He said, you need to prophesy in the building. That's what we come here for, to learn God's word. And that's why he says, if you go back there to that verse 4, he says, Prof, uh, the one that prophesies edifies the church. It builds up the church. God's word is what builds us. Y'all mind going one other place? Go to Ephesians. Did y'all know we're already out of time? No, we're not. Golly. Keep going. Keep going. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I think Brother Blitzen answered my question. Good. He said that uh, prophecy as far as we're concerned doesn't mean foretelling the future. Not necessarily. It really never has, Brother Spitty. Uh, oftentimes they would, would say something that's going to happen centuries later. But if you go back and read the prophets, Daniel, Ezekiel, and all them, they were talking about specific things at that specific time. It, it means words coming directly from oh, God. God. It, can it be about the future? Absolutely. Sure. It was, it was uh, revelation from God is what prophecy is. Go to chapter 4 in Ephesians and look at verse 11. He's specifically talking about the gifts and why they were given. Okay? <clears throat> Uh, if you go back to verse 8, 9, and 10, it talks about what Jesus did between the cross and his ascension. What he did when he was in the grave, that he took, he gathered up the people in Sheol and took them to the place, place of God. So we know that the gifts began after the ascension. Look at verse 11. He gave some apostles, some prophets, there's the prophecy, some evangelists, an evangelist is just one that tells the good news. And some pastors and some teachers. To be a pastor and a teacher then, you had to have the gift. You had to have a gift of prophecy. You had to have the ability. Because again, they didn't have the New Testament. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. In other words, this was the reason these gifts were given. Did you all know that's the same exact reasons the Bible says we have God's word today? We come to be edified, to be built up, to be strengthened, to grow. And it's only through God's word that that can happen. Now, please look at verse 13. What is the first word in verse 13? Until. We, we would say until, right? In other words, these gifts are given for this purpose until we all come in the unity of the faith. Or in other words, when God's word comes all together. When the faith comes all in one place. When the doctrines come all in one place. And of the knowledge of the Son of God. Into a perfect man, the perfect stature. Wherefore we're no more children. Tossed to and fro, carried by every wind of doctrine. So again in Ephesians he says the same thing he said in 1 Corinthians. These gifts are for this purpose until we get this. So what he was doing in 1 Corinthians. He said your church service doesn't need to be a bunch of people hooping and hollering and showing off their abilities. It needs to be giving God's word. And only one person at a time talk, please. <laughs> and ladies, don't talk because you're not supposed to teach in the assembly anyway. That's what he said all in chapter 14. Now, do we have prophecy today? Absolutely, but we have it written down. We have the complete or perfect prophecy. It's right here. Is there any revelation outside of God's word today? Nope. It is absolutely complete. We have the end. We have the Lord coming back. We have the new heaven, new earth. We have everything right here. Uh, I think me and you've talked about it before. There is a uh, terrible false doctrine that, that goes around even uh, missionary Baptist churches called New Lightism where people actually believe that there are new revelations that come to church members outside of God's word. That's dangerous. Where God's word tells us we should weigh everything according to God's word. There are, 19 of Revelation 22 says if any man. Yeah, don't add to it, don't take from it. The plagues of the book will be added to him. It's not just the book of Revelation, by the way. It's talking about that that's a plural word, mm -hmm. books. The Bible ends by saying don't add to it, don't take from it. It's done, it's complete. Absolutely.
So if you want to look at it, and if you're mature enough to see it, chapter 14 will tell us how to be pleasing to God in our assembly meeting. Do y'all know why all we do is look at God's word? Because that's what he told us to do. That's the main thing uh, God's services should be, is the teaching of God's word. But the only thing that we can do is read the Bible. Mm -hmm. We can't. None of us knows when the world's going to end. Yeah. None of us knows when Christ is going to come back. We've got signs, but they ain't nobody can foretell it. Nope. And, and That's I, the only thing I was getting at. I absolutely. Didn't understand. And I don't have a gift uh, greater than you at understanding it. If you want to understand more, study more. Uh, I, I will say this in closing. Look, look at that chapter 14, verse 1. The one thing that we Baptists do in overkill. The Bible tells us to desire spiritual gifts. We are so scared of being called charismatic. We don't ever talk about the gifts. We don't ever pray for gifts. There are still three remaining gifts according to chapter 13. Faith, hope, and love. These are still special God-given abilities above what we can naturally have that are given to members of God's churches. And I'm afraid we're missing the boat. How many of us are truly desiring and asking and uh, using the, the gifts that we have? Uh, I will tell you this, as a pastor, I have been around people uh, in every church that I've been at that even though I don't know, I mean, only God knows, uh, I had a strong suspicion that uh, just by the way they acted that uh, you could see uh, like one, one, one's faith just had outrageous faith. Uh, uh, one, you know, you go through that. One loves beyond what's normal. Do I believe that God still gives these three gifts out to his churches? Absolutely. And I think we're missing the boat by not praying for them and asking for them more. We Baptists want to say, well, the gifts are gone. Well, they all are except for three. But guys, we need those three to take God's word and do with it what he wants us to do.